I've seen how it's empowered communities. I've seen how it's empowered people and individuals and allowed people to go beyond just their little studio and then build fully fledged businesses. And I think it's important for be it the designer and the consumer to understand. Hmm. I love and hate that question because yeah. I think up to now I still don't know how to articulate that moment, but yeah. I will try. Okay. So, uh, a lot of people will know by now that initially I wanted to be an, an astronomer. So that was up until Form 3 maybe. I was obsessed with the universe, planets, that sort of thing. I even had a whole counter book with my research on, oh, this planet has been discovered, this planet is dead, Ooh, yada yada. Right? And then boom, in Form 4, I had a spiritual awakening where I got born again. And then during conversations with God, I got to understand who I was and yeah. you know, ultimately who I am. And it was in that season that I realized that I had a calling or a purpose rather in the fashion space. And it was primarily to do with the humanitarian side of fashion. So how do we use it as a tool for so, um, social change, community development? And I guess my main focus would be helping victims of sexual abuse. And obviously yeah. I'll explain it on in the interview, but um, it was around that time, so that was form four. And then from that moment onwards, when you say yes to that, things start unfolding, I was meeting people, I was encountering moments, I was, you know, just, it's like God then just opens up an avenue for you and then you know that this is it for me, you know, this, this is my calling, yeah. you know, so that's Ooh, how it happened. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. that's, I, that, I think that's the one thing that I didn't expect, the astronomer bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, wait, wait, no. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know how many moons Jupiter has. <laughs> Ooh, quite <laughs> interesting. <laughs> And so, so that's when you started, did you actually start doing fashion like within school or you were like doing it outside of school? Like what was going on there? Funny enough, um, so obviously we know in high school you'd get the option of fashion and fabrics or art, which yeah. would be the most sensible thing for one to do. But yeah. in my case, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do fashion, but let me study French and literature. So that's what I did. Mm. So I took French courses at the Alliance Francaise since then. And then I was doing literature, obviously. But then in high school, I literally, I hated fashion and fabrics, which is so strange. Same here. I literally did not like it. So that was <laughs> primarily, the sewing part, I was like, what? It's too technical, it's ugh. So I didn't like it. And so I just focused on those two subjects. Um, although I did French more as a language than a subject. And then it was only around the holidays of Form 4 after exams that I started interning at Zuba, I did the Moyo Fashion Week in Zimbabwe. Yeah. That's when my journey actually started. So it was definitely outside the classroom. I went straight into the workforce. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I love that you said that you hated fashion fabrics. Like there's, there's nothing I hated more than fashion and fabrics in, it, in high school, man. Mm. Like, it was a pain. Like, Don't even take me back there. Mm -mm, Trauma. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that you were... So when you were studying French, um, I'm interested in that particularly because you then went to France and, and went to like study fashion there. Mm -hmm. So when you were studying French in high school, was this like part of the plan or it was a thing you were just doing? Honestly, I don't think at the time I knew why. I yeah. just, I, because I love languages and I was just like, I'm going to study French. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. I had no intentions of going to be in West Africa. I was just like, I love this language. And yeah. I guess the culture around France and, you know, French, the language really fascinated me. So I guess that was the first part of God saying, you know, just be obedient, do you this thing, do this. and it will make sense later on. So it, it only made sense for me in upper six when I was doing, you know, uni research. And I was like, huh. France is fashion. Yeah. Voila. <laughs> so that's literally how it The unfolded. dominoes are falling exactly. into place. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Um, French, quite challenging for me. Uh, my French is very limited to... My favorite phrase though, uh, comme ci, comme ça. Oh, I love, I love it. That. And you know, it actually applies in the English sense now. You can yeah. literally respond, oh, comme ci, comme ça. It, it works for everything. <laughs> it, it works. It works for everything. How's, how's them, comme ci, comme ça? How yeah. are you, comme ci, comme ci, comme ça? Are you good? <laughs> it's a cheat code. I love it that. Is. I love that phrase. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, France. You actually ended up going to uh, a study in France, and maybe a bit of context here is, you obtained your bachelor's in fashion and apparel design. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called. Was it called Esmod? Yes. How do we pronounce that? 
you know, the short form is ISMOD. Okay. That all makes Fantastic. sense. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like an institution in France. Yes. So not to brag, but it was, yeah. I think it's one of the oldest or the oldest fashion school in the world. Mm. And that's where you, they invented the measuring tape and the dress form, the mannequin. Yeah. So it's primarily just for fashion design. And it's, a, it's like a small college. You know it if you're in the, you know, the fashion industry. world. Exactly. Okay. So you, you go here for a couple of years, I think three or four? Uh, yes, three in total. Yeah, three and a half, three? thereabouts, yeah. yeah. Not counting the internship years. But yeah. yeah, so you, you, you were studying there, uh, you said, I said what, fashion, uh, apparel design, mm -hmm. uh, pattern making. Yes. And then you did complete like internships, like you said. Um, so the thing that's always interested me about that is um, France, uh, Paris in particular is, I think that's like one of the fashion capitals of the world, the right? Of fashion. Yeah, like <laughs> yes. it's like really big, like they've got like fashion week, all of these like really huge yeah. experiences, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think you, you gained from this experience, like the studying, the interning, that whole period in France mm -hmm. that you might not have gotten here in Zim? Hmm. Very good question. I think, like, I mean, look, it's a cliche, but yeah. Paris is fashion. And what I mean by that is that you don't actually have to be in school to understand that it's in the streets, it's in the metro, it's in the supermarket. The people see fashion, it's, it's almost like a, a lifestyle. And by that, I don't mean, you know, just wearing pretty clothes. It's in the way the outfits come together. It's in the choice of fabric. It's in the way they make textures. And this is just all ordinary people, not really like your fashion yeah. things, you know? So for me, the biggest takeaway from France really was just how they're very passionate about construction of garments. Yeah. So you will literally be given a white shirt to construct and the focus is not in the design, but it's in how the seams are coming together, where the darts are placed, how the buttons are lined. You know, it's it's down to the nitty gritty. So I really needed that foundation because yeah. wherever you end up in life, even if you just want to be a creative person, you need to know how the pieces come together. So I guess that's where the math and the science came in. Honestly, struggle through it, yeah. but it was necessary. And also just an appreciation of the world of luxury. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it makes you, and I think it was after my experience there that I was like, look, among many other things, my desire is to bring more beauty into the world, you know, because they, yeah. uh, they speak the language of beauty, the language of luxury and just intentional living. So that's what I really got from my time Ooh. there, you know. I love that. Mm. I love that. And, and the, that focus on, on fundamentals is quite important because, yeah, sometimes I think it's, it's missing. Yeah. I think sometimes it feels like it's missing, especially back here in Zim, mm -hmm. where maybe for justifiable reasons, but we still do want like um, that different, um, just that different level of quality that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's I really interesting. Um, in a separate interview, I think, mm -hmm. or on your LinkedIn, uh, mm -hmm. you talked about, you know, um, during your time, that time in France that we're talking about, that three years, and maybe for context, what, um, from what year to what year was this? So that we can so just have some context. That was mid-2015, so September 2015 to about 2018. Yeah, yeah. okay, fantastic. Uh, and during that time, um, the hype was um, knitwear, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I knew, um, going into this, I knew you actually did like a knitwear uh, collection with a tie-in with a soul dreams yes a stranger to the earth mm -hmm. but that's very different from what you're doing now with uh, tp tmk period yes. uh, so maybe let's start with a stranger to the earth and then transition into tp um, of course with a stranger to the earth and knitwear like what are you trying to achieve there and maybe why are you not as is prolific the word? Mm -hmm. Why are you not, why is the output not as much as TMK period? Wow, this is taking me back to my journal right now. <laughs> <laughs> because to be fair, like you said, uh, around that time, I think we were, because after your first two years, you then finalize or specialize yeah. in your final year and with different options. And I think it was in a consultation with one of my lecturers, they're like, look, 
knitwear is actually very underrated because people don't really think about it because people you know always assume it's a seasonal thing where yeah. it's like my juicy it's for winter, winter. Right? but it's in the global fashion world it's bigger than that i think just cashmere alone which is part of the knitwear space yeah. is estimated to be worth 2.8 billion in 2024 this is not even like the whole knitwear sector it's just a tiny mini yeah. bit so if you can think about that then you do the numbers with you know bit wool be it you know and jersey and all that stuff you then realize that it's a it's a very lucrative industry but there isn't a lot of designers or you know um people in that space so for me i was like look this kind of makes sense because now that I'm about to graduate, it's going to be competitive post-graduation, so how do I stand out? But beyond that, I think on a personal level, a spiritual level, the name Sharon in the Bible, it talks about, it's a space in Israel that is known as a fold of flocks. So yeah. I, I was like, okay, Lord, why are you trying to say to me, fold of flocks, sheep, wool, yeah. nature, boom. Literally, that was the final confirmation I needed. I was like, okay. I might be reaching, but this makes sense to me spiritually. Yeah. So I focus on knitwear because it's also tied to a lot of um, Zimbabwean te traditional techniques of making clothes. A lot of our grandmothers, mothers oh, yeah. actually sustain families through, you know, knitting. So I was like, look, this is a great start because I want my fashion or my brand or my journey in fashion to make sense, to have impact, to influence communities. So knitwear was the perfect way to explore that. And then the final thing also was that I think a stranger to the earth, which is brought up, was yeah. how I then entered into the just the global fashion arena. That was my third year collection. And why I named it a stranger to the earth is because I think I was going through a very difficult time mentally. Like I, I yeah. really understood what depression was and I felt like I did not belong anywhere. And <laughs> Oh, hence the name. Hence a stranger to the earth. Okay. Because I was like, where Fair enough. literally I don't belong here. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I was like, boom, that's gonna be the name. And I think we also then learn about people who are I guess the faith fathers of the word who are known as strangers to the earth, right? They don't belong here. Yeah. So I identified a lot with that. And so Stranger to Earth is really about exploration, it's about concepts, it's about posing questions, exploring narratives. It's highly conceptual and that's why it's been on the download currently because I think right now fashion is largely commercial. So that's yeah. why TP is much louder. A stranger to earth has to feel inspired. So I don't create unless I know that the inspiration is there. So it's been a, a drought for about three years. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. created anything besides a, you know the Soul Dreams, the collection, Soul Dreams collection, which was really around street where you know something current, something Zimbabwe and hence the Chando knits. Yeah. Um, so that's the story around the stranger to the earth. It 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 comes out when it needs to. Yeah. Like, there's no question there. Fair I hear that. <laughs> Literally, I... yeah. <laughs> and then so we move to Tiamke Piri. Um, the first thing that interests me there is I know Tiamke is one of your names, mm -hmm. but the Piri. I'm like, what what does that mean? What's <laughs> happening with that name? Why yeah. why that name in particular? Um. So think of this. A lot yeah. of people, and I'd say in Africa, in America, in Asia as well, when we look at European luxury houses, we don't complain when we have to figure out how to pronounce Schiaparelli, Balenciaga, Louis Vuitton. It to us, we're like, we need to figure out how to pronounce this. Yeah. But when it comes to African names, we want to find the short form. We want to make it, you know, easy to pronounce. So yeah. I was like, nah, 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 nah. We're going to build a luxury Afro looks brand. And we're going to call it something that's purely African. So, like you rightfully said, Tiamike is my middle name. Yeah. That speaks to my Malawian heritage. And then Piri is our clan name or last oh, name. Okay. Exactly. So I was like, yeah, people are going to have to figure out how to pronounce this. Yeah. Tiamike Piri. You know, that, that's literally how it came about. Oh, that's yeah. interesting, man. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And <laughs> so, like, you. You, you touched on something there. It's an Afro uh, looks brand. Mm -hmm. When when did that start? I think twenty nineteen. Yes, at midnight in like at July. midnight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Look, I remember when I, I need I... to hear the story. What was what, what's the yeah. origin story? I wish it was deeper, <laughs> but the name itself came about way before I went to college. Because you know, yeah. I you know, I'm I'm sure you're one of those people. You journal, you write down notes yeah. a lot. So I was just saving notes as I you know would daydream because I daydream a lot. I love I love being a dreamer. So I was just thinking, I was like, if I ever start a fashion brand, what do I call it? Tiamike Piri, Tiamike Dinglesi, blah, blah, blah. So I saved Tiamike Piri Harari and I was like, I don't know, it'll make sense in the future. So I think I was on Law 6 at the time. And then fast forward, I come back home in 2018, 2019, and I realized that I still couldn't find a space 
that I could belong in, a stranger to the earth, right? Yeah. And I was like, let me create a platform, let me create a table and a brand that speaks to the essence of who women are and affirm the beautiful truths of who they are. And it, why I say it was a midnight, because I was having these thoughts literally at midnight, I think it was in July, and I was still dealing with depression, mental health issues, and I was yeah. like, I went on my Illustrator, created my logo, I was like, TP, that's going to be easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> and then went on Instagram, boom, boom, started an account, and I was like, yep, open for business. That's literally how it happened. Mm. And from then on... It just... Yeah. Wow, that's it interesting. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that because that, that speaks to just doing. Like, yeah, just do it. Just... Ooh, that. I, I, it actually speaks to, to something you said I think on your Instagram um, mm. I need to remember this because it was so profound I saw it and I was like what this is crazy really was it a post um, one thing I've learned is the angels won't descend from the heaven and blow a trumpet to announce yes. your readiness yes. you yes. just have to do it I'm, I hope I'm paraphrasing but I'm, I know I'm really it. close wow. <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> no, I'm really yeah. close. But yeah, I I love stuff like that. I mm. really do. So you start like that, and so the the fabrics, the designs, everything follows post that. Honestly, I mean, obviously the blueprint is always there within our souls. I mean, you would know as a creative yeah. and a creator and a storyteller yeah. that. You might not have the full picture, but you've got little the seeds with it. It's the, oh, the recipe, okay. voila, it's in you. So I think when I started, all I had was, I was like, Lord, I, I've created the page, I've created the platform, now you show me how to run the show because I'm obedient, I'm here, I'm here to serve. So I've always known that I want to work with natural fabrics that are, you know, obviously environmentally friendly, but also feel good against, you know, people's skin. Yeah. So. I think from then on, I was like, the best way, the best business model rather to make this make sense is a made to order approach. So my first few clients were definitely, you know, graduates, birthdays, brides, that sort of thing in prom. Yeah. And so that was me now trying to figure out what do women want in them? Because as designers or as creatives or artists, we have what we want to give into the world, which is fair and fine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it has to make sense. The money has to be there. So for me, through custom design, I would have these extensive interviews with people, consultations rather, yeah. where I was like, okay, so what do you like? What fabrics do you want? Uh, how do you want to feel when you enter a room? Blah, 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 blah. So it was literally like a mind map where I would then like collect all that information. And that's what then helped me when I pivoted into ready to wear collections. Yeah. It was just understanding women and their desires. So that's, I think that's how the story unfolded from 2019 up to, we launched our first ready to wear collection in 20, last, what was last year? 2022? 2022? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Voila. That I was mean, it. January is always a tricky I'm, time. Because I know because it's like last year already. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't know where you we don't stand know. like dates wise, <laughs> exactly. but yeah, last year, 2022. <laughs> mm. Yes. That's when we were officially like. Now you can pre-order stuff that were, you know, designed and it's, you know, available in stores or off the rail, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Congratulations with that, man. That's a, that's a big thing. Um, Truly. Particularly because uh, I know that last year was also like a challenging year for you because at some point, like close to the mid-year point of the year, you had almost decided, not almost, I think you had actually decided that, hey, this is over, we're shutting the brand down. Um, what was happening there? What, what was going on? Wow. Do you know, I don't know, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, where yeah. there's phases in your life that when you look back, you're like, you get goosebumps, you're like, how do I survive that? For me, that was last year around, I think as of June, definitely the winter leading yeah. up to August. I think I hit a wall in the business where, and I, I say this very openly, that I'm... I primarily come across as a designer and then as a business owner second. And I'm yeah. trying to figure out that balance. Um, so I think at the time I was like, great, I've designed this collection based on people's feedback, but I still wanted you know, Sharon the artist to come out. So it was a very difficult time for me to figure out that balance where you know, the art and the commerce had to make sense. Yeah. So I think when winter came, 
which is, you know, the time for winter collections, I was like, so should a stranger to the earth come out? But I don't feel inspired. And TP doesn't really do knitwear collections, so how yeah. do I figure this out? So obviously business was extremely low because I was like, I'm not going to buckle under the pressure of winter, you know, produce a winter collection when I'm not ready. It will be very unfair on the brand and ultimately my, my clients. Yeah. So we did not produce any winter collection around that time. And around June, July, things were just going south, man. <laughs> I was not feeling inspired. Yeah. And people were producing collections as well. I was like, how are they doing that? Like, where's the inspiration coming from? And also, I think I was just, Zim got really, really tough. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of us can relate to that. Yeah. So I started questioning everything. I was like, why, what am I doing? Like, why am I struggling? What's can I just not, what's the point of all of this? Who commissioned me to start a brand? <laughs> you know, how dare I? You know, so it was really, I remember for like six weeks straight, I was at home just watching Scandal to cope. I was like, look, I'm not even going to like pretend to like take garden walks and like journal, blah, blah. That was, I was like, I'm, I'm going in the to trenches. Be, you know, I was like, I'm in the trenches and it is hard and I quit. But at the same time, I was like, my clients, well, like yeah. the girls that were trying to help through this brand. So that's what probably kept me going. However, when the business is not making sense, your finances start looking shaky. So yeah. end of July, still hadn't come out of it, decided that, look, I'm going to sell my machines and switch careers. I wrote in my emails, there's literally applications where I was now looking into marketing, development. You yeah. know, you start, you're like, look, but I'm a was this like still in fashion or? No, I was like, I'm a multifaceted <laughs> human being. You know, you start convincing yourself, but you know, fashion is a yeah. hobby. Yeah. I can be. You a, ignore the voice. I was like, no, I could be a PR, like a pub publicist, or I could be a communications person. I went yeah. exploring everywhere. I was like, I can start again. It's never too late. Yeah. But I think that's the wilderness stage that every single one of us has been through or will go through in life. And yeah. it's only now, in retrospect, I look back, I'm like, oh, wait. So that was, I had lessons that I needed to learn about how the world works and how, regardless of what you're going through, your passion or your purpose should never change. And it's okay, you know, the children of Israel went through a wilderness stage before yeah. Canaan. Mm. And it's not so much about reaching the destination, but it's about the lessons you're learning through the journey. And yeah. I'm glad that I had definitely had my clients that were like, girl, if you give up, then where are we buying our clothes? It was literally like, you cannot do this to us, yeah. right? <laughs> and like I said, um, the, the community side of TP where we're helping girls, who are victims of sexual abuse to get into school, pursue their passions, it's like, what happens to them? You know? And then yeah. my my team, my small, small team, like how do I how do I explain to them that I don't feel inspired anymore? So, you know, your work is over. So after that, again, back to the prayer. So had you, had yeah. you actually like sold the machines? I did sell one of my machines. Because oh. I was like, I kind of need the money now. And yeah. also, I don't want a reminder of this TP stuff. Like, I'm, I saw the machine. <laughs> like a clean Literally, break. Yeah, let me start again. <laughs> that money, I will use it to, like, start another course online yeah. or whatever. But, so the machine is gone. <laughs> and I regret it. But I guess it was a phase. <laughs> Part of the lessons, I suppose. Yeah. Part of the lessons, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's very interesting, man. Um, and so with... One of the things, one of the experiences, you, you touched on something very interesting there where um, you're a creative and this haunts creatives, right? Like you're like uber creative, but how do we make the business make sense? Well, right? A, a, away from the creative, you almost have to split yourself in two, like CEO, founder, <laughs> and then the creator. Yeah. Like how do we make that work? Um, one of the things you, I think recently did uh, Zim Trade. Um, Eagle's Nest, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't put that down in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thankfully I remembered. Um, what, for you, I'm assuming that's to fill that gap, right? The, the business acumen and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the things you're seeing, like maybe that other creatives could tap into in terms of like business? What are like the things to look out for? Wow, this is okay. I'll try to be brief with this one. Yeah, but I think I, it's a loaded question because truly. I didn't like write it down. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah bear with me. <laughs> no, no, you're good. I think I'm glad you brought that up because ultimately, I think a lot of our businesses or passions, desires tend to die within a few years, not because we're not good enough or because yeah. 
we're not gifted enough or life is unfair it's really just the business that makes sense you know so for me thankfully and i'm really really grateful for this i i think that was some time last year where i realized that look you've got the gift you've got the talents this is your calling yeah. but make it make sense and you have to dumb it down to okay what am i not good at i was like numbers Mm-mm, i'm not good at that yeah. they scare me i look at numbers they swirl around and it just doesn't make sense to me yeah. and i was like i'm not very strong at administration i'm not very you know i listed out everything literally and then i realized that it, with today's world with the internet and the digital era you can learn the things that you do not know there's udemy there is masterclass there all these courses mm. skillshare where you can fill in the gap so zim trade for me came, came at a time that i was obviously asking these questions and i was like i'm not really going to go to business school because yeah. i don't have the time or the money you know <laughs> so what do we what do i do right so thankfully and I, this is not a zim trade promo please yeah. but i honestly encourage people to hashtag not an ad <laughs> not an ad don't sue me plus um but i i think the competition was primarily around um incubating youth owned businesses and making them export ready so you go into this room with about so with the application processes you apply online i think they just pick from a nationwide pool and then they narrow it down to like 50 to 60 applicants from Bulawayo, Mtare, Harare, etc. And then I remember the first day I walked in there and I was like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. these, are, these are not hobbies or passions. This is not a private dream. It's businesses here and you yeah. own. And I was so inspired and challenged at the same time by the fact that these are young people just like me living in the same conditions in Zim. But they're starting all these amazing businesses. Yeah. There's leather. There is, you know, banana chips. There's solar, whatnot. And I was like, eek. So I was like, look, I'm very much in a lion's den. But I will survive, you That's know, cool. and I'm just here to learn. So for me, I was like the biggest win already because I mean the competition had a final winner. I was like the biggest win is are the lessons I'm going to learn. So they take you through a six week course of just it's like a crash course into business from uh, not really accounting but just financial management, yeah. human resources, packaging, you know, exploring trade, um, down to the nitty gritty of just personal branding. And honestly, I'm still like wow, I'm so grateful I applied. I remember I sent in my application at midnight again <laughs> whilst i was at, like my uncle's funeral i was just like oh, look i have nothing to lose i'm just gonna Might send the well. application yeah. might as well boom got accepted and then you know obviously it was a beautiful journey um our brand just grew so much we are not just a creative expression but we're now on the way to be fully fleshed enterprise a that business. is going to impact lives exactly yeah. a full-on yeah. business and i'm like come through <laughs> you know always great eh? because that also comes with like sustainability it doesn't there's nothing wrong with uh, a thing being like a phase, but that longevity at times can also mm. mean like more impact, right? Exactly. It, it, you get to get to the ends of your purpose. Yeah, your vision yeah, is yeah. clearer, you know? Oh, that's great. Uh, and, and by the way, you're the second uh, ZimTrade alumni. Really? Who was the first? Uh, Nigel. Oh, Nigel. Anna. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. That yeah. was the first. <laughs> oh, wow. I need to watch his interview. Shout it's out. Not out yet. Uh, oh. It's not out when we're recording it, but when oh. this goes out, it, it's been out. Okay. okay. So it's out, but it's not out. Oh, um, Fashion Council of Zimbabwe. Mm. Um, you're a board member on the recently established uh, Fashion, Fashion Council. Mm-hmm. I think what we'll touch on first is, I think we can touch on both of these things. Yeah. What's your role and then what's the council hoping to achieve? What's the North Star for the council? Hmm. So I think a lot of people would know that Zimbabwe has struggled really to establish itself as a fashion center, yeah. especially in Africa. I think the world in general is looking to Africa now because they've exhausted Europe, they've exhausted America more or less exhausted Asia. Now it's like Africa, what's next? Yeah. So with the council, I mean, it's been in the works for years. I think since I was in high school even. Yeah. So the people I'm now serving on the board with the people that mentored me, people I worked for. So it's truly an honor and I'm truly humbled that I get to be on the table now. And yeah. I think my main focus currently is to represent the voices of young designers and upcoming brands yeah. and also be part of the decision makers around Zimbabwean fashion or African fashion obviously in the long term and our goal as a council is to spotlight Zimbabwean creatives and it's not really just about fashion designers now we extend it to photographers makeup artists models you know the full ecosystem so yeah. we understand that you 
you know, alone you can do a lot, but together we can go far. Cliche, yeah. I know, but it's very, very true right now in the fashion space, and I think in the creative space in general, where we're like, for the government to listen to us, for the world to listen to us, we have to come together as a collective, as a structured body, yeah. and then now we can start talking about laws and you know, statutory instruments yeah. and all that stuff. When we talk about um, the policies that we want to see in our space, who do we talk to? And it's not so much actually about who to talk to, it's how do we present our case? So yeah. that's, those are some of the issues we're trying to figure out as a console, where we're like, fashion now has to make sense. It has to go beyond, oh, I'm a tailor in a room. It's, yeah. I am building a sustainable brand, but how do I do that? What are the networks I need to build? Who do I need to talk to? Why do we have cheap fabric? As, a, as the only option in Zimbabwe, how do we fix that? Who yeah. do we talk to again? So that's, those are some of the things we're trying to tackle and just really celebrate Zimbabwean culture. I think as a country, a lot of people agree with me that yep. we've struggled <laughs> with identity. We don't know who we are, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it comes yeah. down to just the fabric that we're using as the national print. How do we come up with that? Who is designing it? And we have to take control of that. Yeah. So that's, you know, so some of the things we're working on as a council. And my main role, besides obviously amplifying the voices of young designers, is I'm on the social media side. So I help in creating content, communicating with people online, and again, just keeping the council young and modern and relevant. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great to hear. And so that thing you mentioned about um, the national dress is interesting because that um, comes into national comes and goes out of national interest right um i think they might have done something to that effect yeah, there is. Uh, <laughs> last year but indeed to mixed reviews and me saying mixed reviews is being quite generous <laughs> rightfully so <laughs> but yeah that thing with identity is like a a really a really true thing mm -hmm. um in fashion, and, and maybe this is a, a vague question, how does that manifest itself in fashion? In terms of identity? Yeah. Oof. So fashion, which is, a, I hope a lot of people understand this, that it's beyond the clothes and fashion yeah. week and all that stuff. It's a, a language, it's a communication, and you, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, but honestly, that's what we do. I look at you and in two seconds, based on what you're wearing, I can sort of determine who you are. Yeah. So what you bring out, like the choices you make when it comes to clothing, a reflection of who you are on the inside. And you might do this intentionally or unintentionally, but unfortunately it is what There's it is. Effect. You know, so when you look at um, national dress, um, a lot of African countries have their own specific way of dressing and we tend to see it reflected during important events, be it uh, Ruras, you know, yeah. inaugurations, blah, 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 blah. Funerals, so, EDC. You know, that's when it really, really comes out. So a nation is identifiable by its dress as well. You know that in Nigeria, you're going to have the, the print, the, you know, the big dresses, you've got the hair drafts, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, the whole of Africa has adopted that, but, yeah. you know, story for another no. day. So I think <laughs> it, I think as a fashion industry in Zim, it's, I think it's part of our mandate is to remind the Zimbabwean person, be it, you know, you're from Ativiri land, Mashona land, Manika land, that fabric literally puts us together. So we have to go back in the past and be like, who are we? Unfortunately, yeah. a lot of our history has been destroyed. So it's going back to basics and we're like, okay, what are we as a people in terms of yeah. color, texture, print? Do we actually have print? Or is our fabric more toned down and neutral toned? Are we more on the linen or the cotton side? I think Ghana has really solidified that. Their kente is woven in a specific way with specific yeah. colors, with a specific weight as well. So I admire that. I'm like, no, Zimbabwe deserves that. It's yeah, not. That's very it, intentional. It's very voila. It's very intentional. It's a thought out process. So even South Africa has the shui shui, has this, the, the beadwork. It's all part of national identity. So I think we're now on the, on the right path. Of achieving that yeah. and it should not be a political matter it should not be a tribal issue yeah. it should be the one thing that brings us together as a collective mm -hmm. and that is also the job of the fashion you know industry that's interesting that's Thank interesting you. so yeah fashion industry i love that you then use that word because perfect segue into something you said um a couple of years ago i can't calculate because again 2023 yeah whatever, i still don't know <laughs> In, in 2019, I think, or 2020, mm. one of the things you mentioned is that um, Zim does not have a fashion industry yet. This was in 2019. Mm -hmm. Has anything changed since then? 
what's what's the lay of the land now how in your view? i'm really happy you brought that up because it's forcing me to reflect yeah where i'm like <laughs> huh yeah you have to like do a stock huh. take of the past you know what, 2019 three years? all i remember was yeah. covid yeah. yeah but now i'm like no <laughs> <laughs> a lot of other wonderful things were happening and i think at that time zimbabwe was now in a space where a lot of the clothes we wore or wear, well, actually wore at the time, were either secondhand or thrifted, or yeah. we have a tailor or seamstress that just makes it for us. Yeah. And now, looking back, we're in 2023, but I think especially last year in 2021, a lot of brands have been, you know, coming out. People have been exploring fashion. We've got fabric parties. We've got yeah. new fashion shows. And beyond that, I think what has made brought about all this significant change is that. Finally, the consumer is like, we want fashion. And because there, there's been a lot of brands, to be fair. At the time when I was in high school, we had Zim Fashion Week, yeah. we had Harari Fashion Weekend. The designers were there, but the consumers were not receptive. It was in vogue. It was, right? Yeah, it was, it was just like, okay, cool, whatever. Yeah. Mm. It was probably also too theatric or just too yeah. out there. So I think there was a shift around 2019, 2020, where designers started speaking the language that the consumers could understand. They look, I just yeah. want a pretty satin dress. You know, so the fashion industry is beyond just making outrageous gowns. Of course, there's a space for that. Yeah. It's also just looking at it like, huh, maybe they just want a simple white T-shirt. Like, I love what my mom was doing, shout out Munya. Yeah. And because that street where that Ooh, they're is good. Yeah, they're good. really, they're really good. good. I'm like, oh, I had the to like, take a second to think <laughs> and like, be like, <laughs> okay, yeah, I found yeah it. exactly. <laughs> so, I'm glad that brands like that exist now where the ordinary Zimbabwean who is not interested in art or fashion, you know, it could be a lawyer, it could be a dentist. They're like, look, I'm wearing something locally made yeah. and it fits into my lifestyle. And I think it's, it, I applaud the designers for getting to that point yeah. where they don't just want to create art. It's building a business again. Yeah. So finally, I can it's actually be like, exactly, we have an industry and it's growing. It's obviously still in its infancy. We have a lot to, a lot of structures to, to build and to solidify. Thank you for the counsel. But yeah. I think we're literally doing better than we were when I was in high school. Because I remember at the time I literally had a comb through. I'm like, okay, where can I enter? And the, the options were limited. Yeah. Who do I talk to? Like, even yeah. if it was fashion weekend, it was the same aesthetic, big dresses, glitz, glam, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't fashion for normal people, yeah. you know? So yeah. honestly, we're doing well. We have oh, so man. much work to do, but we're doing really, really well. That's beautiful yeah. to hear. I love that. I love that. And then I think this is also, this also ties in line with that more on a foundational level, because one of the things you've, um, been an advocate for is is fashion education. You you believe that that's incredibly important, mm -hmm. right? So, for me, I'd have to understand um, what is fashion education and why do you feel it's vital in the context of Zimbabwean fashion. Hmm. Oh, going to throw in another cliche, but knowledge yeah. is power. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, my passion in fashion education comes from, I think. I've seen how it's empowered communities, I've seen how it's empowered people and individuals and allowed people to go beyond just their little studio and then build fully fledged businesses. And I think it's important for be the designer and the consumer to understand what it is about this shirt. Okay, so there's the construction, there is the fabric sourcing, there is the technical drawing, there is, you know, the final sewing and you know putting it on the rail and then eventually getting to the end user yeah. we need to understand what each process entails because then we can't tackle and i can't convince you that sustainability matters if you don't know what sustainability is all about yeah. and beyond that i need you to understand why wearing a linen shirt is better for your kids than wearing a not official well i guess a a, a man-made fabric because yeah. of you know carbon inputs water usage blah 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 so I think in Zim, we have an understanding of fashion from a lifestyle perspective. We've got yeah. that on lock, but you know, same with many other countries, we still need to understand why we do what we do. Yeah. Then it has longevity, then it has you know, impact, then it has weight. You know, it's not just a, a, a fad, it's not a trend. It's something that we can pass on to the next generation. So yeah. it, it comes down to that essentially. I'm not saying people should go to fashion school, because yeah. truly some of the <laughs> best designers 
did not did go to go. fashion school. Coco Chanel just started making stuff in the studio. You Ooh, know, I know, right? That's people, interesting. People didn't know that she didn't. I, I didn't know that. Doesn't have a BA in art or fashion design or anything like that. She just did. And she just did, but <laughs> she understood clothing. She, she had a reason why. So I think yeah. fashion education allows you to have a reason why. Is it you want to free women from a specific way of dressing? Is it you want to highlight a specific societal issue? Is it yeah. you've got a political narrative to push? Just understand your why. And I think it, it brings weight and meaning to what you do.